Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third edition of the PhD Colloquium. Today we have uh, the pleasure to hear uh, Kei Miao talk about uh, data-driven robust taxi dispatch approaches. Uh, Faye received her uh, bachelor's degree in 2010 in uh, automation. And uh, since then, she's been working as a PhD student here. Her interests uh, her interest span cyber physical systems and uh, robust control for physical systems. And I'm sure that everyone here is very excited about hearing her instead of me. I will just uh, leave the podium to pay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fei Miao. Today I'm going to talk about my work related to data-driven robust text dispatch approaches. So in the recent years, the revenue of taxi service in U.S. has been growing every year and reached almost 11 billion in 2014. But does it mean that this type of service is already efficient? The answer is no. Based on some report and survey statistics of Transportation Bureau in big cities, for example, San Francisco, the average trips of per taxi is actually decreasing during the past two years. Meanwhile, average waiting time of different regions across the city can be different a lot, and uh, in some regions it's even more than 10 minutes. So these two figures indicate a fact that this type of uncoordinated traditional taxi service is not efficient yet. And also it tells us that since the average waiting time of different regions vary a lot, the taxi as a supply is actually not well balanced distributed across different regions of the city. And also people may think that some on-demand service, for example, Uber and Lyft, actually solves the problem. Well, the advantage of that kind of on-demand service is they really care about reduced customers' waiting time in the sense that once a request comes to the system, they will dispatch either like the nearest uh, taxi to pick up this passenger, or they will find somebody that can reach the passenger in shortest of time. So that's basically the approach. But still something is missing in this kind of on-demand service that they do not consider idle driving distance of taxis. Think about the case when there's still no request to come to the system yet. What will the drivers do? Perhaps they still have to try travel idly, randomly on the street, or based on their own experience to some area they think might be busier later. So consider this kind of problem that there is no good suggestion to drivers before the requests come to the system, and uh, their idle distance is not reduced yet. It comes to the motivation of my problem and uh, research work here. So with the development of data storage and the processing technology and also sensing technology, in this work, I'm considering this structure of cyber physical system. That here, every taxi as a mobile sensing system is equipped with GPS and occupation status sensor. Basically, it can tell the data storage and the dispatch center that what's the GPS coordinate location and uh, whether it already has passengers or is still empty during real time. And also, actually, we already have uh, large amounts of data sets of several years of operational records in big cities, for example, New York, San Francisco, or Rome. Usually one data set can be uh, larger than 100 gigabytes. And these data sets actually provide a lot of information for us what is the predicted demand at different regions across different time of day, a lot of information like that. And uh, we are considering to utilize this kind of predicted demand information in this system. So with predicted model and uh, also real-time sensing information, what can our dispatch sensor do? We actually can design some real-time control strategy that tell those working taxis where to go in 
a higher expectation to pick up future passengers. So for designing a control strategy, what is our metric or how we measure the performance of the control strategy? The metric we are considering in this work first is we want to balance taxi as a supply across the whole city, which means that the demand-supply ratio at each region should be close to the, uh, the demand-supply ratio of the whole city. So before dispatch approach, those uncoordinated service usually cause that the demand-supply ratio at each region varies a lot between this global level. And we hope that after our dispatch approach, this ratio of each region can be very close to the global level. But meanwhile, we don't want drivers to go, for, to go very far idly just to pick up somebody later. So that's why when we're considering balanced vacant taxis throughout the city, we also want to balance them with minimum I total idle driving distance. And since we are applying predicted demand here in the system, usually a learning method will provide us some uncertainty set in this kind of predicted demand model. So that's why when we're making decisions, we should also consider that the model has uncertainties. And we hope this kind of uncertainty will help us make a better decision. So there have been some previous work in intelligent transportation system. For example, um, people in, in machine learning or statistical learning research area have been analyzing the demand model or average speed of vehicles in the whole city based on operational records of vehicles or taxis in the whole city. But uh, they made to provide a clear clue how we can apply those models they learn to improve the service of transportation system in the urban city, in, in urban area. And there have also been control people working on smart transportation systems. For example, they design some coordination uh, strategies among each vehicles, but they usually consider a different objective. For example, they want to minimize customers' waiting time, or they want to minimize the number of rebalancing vehicles for autonomous driving systems. Uh, it's different objective that in our work we consider to minimize, uh, to balance taxi supply with minimum idle driving distance. So in the robust optimization literature, um, people have considered like model uncertainties in doing some um, resource allocation problem. But usually, the formulation of the problem is a standard form of robust problem with either linear programming or some definite programming form of objective functions. Uh, in this work later, we will show that in taxi dispatch problem, um, when we consider model uncertainties, it does not fit any of the standard form of problem. So that's why in our work, we are also considering new theories to solve this type of problem. So our contributions can be summarized here. So we are the first to design a receiving horizon control framework with a large scale taxi dispatch problem that with the receding horizon control framework, we are able to consider both current and anticipated future costs. And also, um, at each step, we are solving a multi-objective optimization problem that we consider to balance taxi supply with minimum idle driving distance. And with this receding horizon control framework, we are able to incorporate large-scale sensing data in real-time control that the historical sensing data used as information to provide the predicted demand for the control framework. Meanwhile, some, the real-time sensing data tells us what's the real position of each vacant taxi after our dispatch solution. And updating this information, we can make future decisions. And also, in this framework, we are able to consider uncertain demand model to design some robust dispatch framework. And uh, for considering this problem, we have proved new theorems that we are able to convert 
a robust optimization problem to equivalent form of convex optimization problem, then we can guarantee computational tractability based on the theorems. And uh, every experiment in our work, we run it on realistic data set. Um, I have tried data from San Francisco and also New York City. So a trace-driven analysis on this data set shows that by a resting horizon control framework, the total idle driving distance can be reduced around 52%, <coughs> and thus error between local supply-demand ratio and global su supply-demand ratio can be reduced about 45%. And also, when we consider model uncertainties in this framework, the robust solutions provide a better result than non-robust solutions. So basically, that's the summary of contribution or summary of work I have done. So now let's first see what's the structure of this racing horizon control algorithm. So the input of the algorithm include a predicted model that in, the, in our work, we focus on the control aspect of this work, basically the second block of this figure here. So in the predict the model part, I'm not designing new algorithm. I'm applying algorithm that can provide demand model for our later control framework. So here we do not restrict the learning methods people can use to provide demand model. Uh, for example, I have tried bootstrap model just to provide average demand at each region during different hour of day. And I have also tried some uh, algorithm that can provide a polyhedral or second order cone form of uncertainty sets. So basically, here we don't restrict the algorithms as long as it can provide us the demand model work for the dispatch approach later. Why do we think history should give us a good indicator of demand? So, for example, um, a historical data can be trip information about every taxi that at what time, uh, what position he picks up some passenger. So if we aggregate such kind of information, at least so we can know that uh, what area is a busy area and uh, what time of one day is some peak hours, things like that. No, but if you change the way taxis are dispatched, you change the behavior of riders. So in other uh, words, I may not call for a taxi in a certain area if I know taxis are hard to find. But if you change the way you dispatch taxis, then you may change my behavior in terms of calling for a ride. So that's why when we use predict model, we also update uh, positions of vacant taxis and occupied taxis. So when so we we can we can um, we can think historical model provide us that um, what is the basic demand or what is the need of people, but uh, the way the taxis uh, no, 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 react to those. No, what I'm questioning is, need is a function of where the taxis are. If uh, I know a taxi is not available, I won't call for it. So you won't you won't have a record of my need for a taxi in your database. Yes, it. Yes. Yes. For, most, for most parts, certain parts of the city will have some demand, which is, has a repeated pattern. Right? Because at certain times of the day, offices close or things like that. Right, but the whole point is to equalize what is it, the, this ratio across regions, which means presumably you're more worried about the areas which have long wait times. Yes. Right? Not the, not, not the areas that are going to have demand because of exogenous reasons like it's rush hour or, you know, people uh, come to work. But uh, um, f for regions without enough supply, perhaps the uh, waiting time is longer than regions with enough supply. So when we start to apply in this approach, we are also collecting new data meanwhile. And uh, this new data can help us to build some model for later dispatch framework. Yeah, so that's why when we 
uh, iteratively solving the optimization problem. We also update GPS record and occupation status of taxis. And uh, these data for the current uh, step provide us uh, estimated serviceability in the future. But uh, we also storage this data for later like data mining to see what happened after we use this framework. And it also kinds of feedback to the control framework here. So every time we update GPS and occupation status of taxis to do some preliminary uh, analysis, basically I'm applying base rule to estimate what's the service of ability of currently occupied taxis because it may turn out to weekend later in several minutes and also pick up some passengers in this area. And then I deduct this part of serviceability from the total demand learned uh, based on historical data set. The remaining part of demand is what I shall serve with weekend taxes now. And then the second step in this block is solving optimization problem based on either a certain demand model and an uncertain demand model. So this is the key part of uh, my work that in the several following slides, I will introduce what is the problem formulation here and what's the theories I have proved to solve this type of problem. So in our dispatch framework, we first care about balance taxi supplies across the whole city. So the left part of the equation, the numerator is basically the demand at one region, and the denominator is the total number of supply after dispatch in one region. And what we want to have is this demand supply ratio at one region equals to the global demand supply ratio of the whole city. And uh, this figure here basically um, explains why this equation represents the total number of vacant taxis uh, within one region. So this equation, if we just uh, use it as a constraint, it might be too strict that we may not be able to get a feasible solution for our optimization problem. So that's why instead of using this equation as a constraint, I s relax it a little bit as a penalty function when this local demand supply ratio is not equal to the global demand supply ratio. And we can have uh, this equation here as a penalty function. So basically it sums the total difference across I regions during totally tau time slots here. But there is still one problem with this penalty function. So when we're considering uncertain demand, it means this demand vector RK is not a fixed value. It can be some value belongs to a set delta, and here, we assume this delta is a closed and complex set because usually demand within limited time it should be some bounded number. And later I will show you that how we can construct such a closed and a complex set from original data set. So now we just assume that this is a closed complex set. So then the problem is, um, in robust op optimization literature, it has been shown that if an objective function or a constraint function with uncertain parameter is concave of the uncertain parameter and the convex of the variable, then we are able to transform this problem to a computationally tractable convex optimization form. But here, this function is actually not concave of RK. So what we do? Our approach is we use a surrogate function to replace this penalty function that when alpha is close to zero, when they minimize 
this penalty function and uh, this surrogate function, their optimal solution are the same. And also, this surrogate function is concave of R k and a convex of x. So with this surrogate function, now we can describe our objective that we want to balance supply when there is demand model uncertainties. So this is objective one. And the second part of objective is we also care about idle driving distance to meet our dispatch order. So basically, when a vacant taxi uh, has a suggestion that he should go to some new regions, it's from some initial position to the dispatch the position. And uh, here we use a type of network flow model that we use the edge weight between two regions as the distance of two regions. So then the total idle driving distance according to our dispatch solution X is described here. So this is objective number two. And then with the two objectives, when without considering model uncertainties, what do we have? So the objective function part is a weighted sum of the two equations. Part one is idle distance, and part two is uh, demand supply ratio. And these constraints just uh, describe what we already have in practical. For example, the second inequality just means the total number of vacuum taxis at each region after dispatch should be a positive number. And the third inequality just means within limited time, an idle an idle taxi cannot drive too far to reach some position. So basically, the distance one taxi can drive during one time slot is limited by the threshold M. And the first equality just uh, describes what's the number of initial vacant taxi related to the number of uh, total vacant taxis in the previous time slots. So these constraints, we can see that it's not directly related to the uncertain demand R. So that's why when we consider the R might be in some set, this robust optimization has the following form that the difference parted, we have RK not a specific value, but it can be any value belongs to this set. So what we can do is minimize the worst case when RK is in this set. And also, by our early explanation that this function is concave of this uncertain parameter R and the convex of all this variable. So we can see that this is not a standard linear programming form or semi-definite programming form because we have uh, the descent variable in the denominator part. And all the constraints, they do not directly have the uncertain parameter. So which means later our main problem is how we can convert this objective function to some equivalent convex optimization form. So here comes our theory of Wait, solution. I don't mm -hmm. see a time variable there. Wait, what? Time? Time. Time is K. Oh, time is K. Yes. Okay. Just one other question. In, mm -hmm. in this re real time formulation, you're still missing traffic conditions. When, when, you, when you talk about uh, distributing the, the, these, these camps, is it, does it come in as a distance constraint? Or? Oh, you mean real, when you when you say real time condition, you mean like congestion or Absolutely. speed? <laughs> yeah. So um, here, for simplicity, I um, use a, a constant thresh, threshold m. But when that information is available, every step we we run this optimization, we can also use an m k 
So it's provided by the model. If the system is able to get like average speed or traffic condition, then of course we can set this uh, threshold as something reflect the current traffic condition. <coughs> So the first type of uncertainty set we consider here is a polyhedral type of uncertainty set described by this inequality here. So then by a strong duality theorem, we can prove that this form of convex optimization problem is equivalent to this form of, uh, the, the form of robust optimization problem is equivalent to this form of convex optimization problem. Basically, the objective function part is just uh, linear programming. And uh, since the other constraints in the problem do not directly include RK, so we just uh, put the constraints together with this problem. And uh, we have one more constraint here. Basically, it's an inequality with the variables still on the denominator part. But this inequality is convex of x and, of course, convex of lambda. So with strong duality theorem, when the objective function is this form, and we can convert it to an equivalent convex optimization problem. So this is for polyhedral uncertain set. And it is possible that we have a second order tone type of <coughs> uncertainty set described like here. So basically, uh, R is the demand at each time slot. It's a vector. And uh, this, this set is described by a standard form of second order cone. So when this is the case, we actually still can transform this problem to an equivalent convex optimization form that still the objective function is some linear programming form. And uh, the other constraints are still the same. So here we have two additional constraints, or three additional constraints, that this design variable is still on the denominator part of one inequality, and uh, the second row, this is also a type of second order cone constraint. So basically, this is a form of convex optimization with a linear programming form of objective and some second order cone constraints, and also a convex form of inequality constraint. So this is still proved basically applying a strong duality theorem. Yes. Someone doesn't actually uh -huh. request a taxi because they think it's too, too much, but now that I am optimizing, I'm going to change uh, the demand. Uh, could you explain, for example, how that would uh, be calculated, I, I hope, in this, in this uh, uncertainty formulation? OK. Um, uh, let's just uh, use this as an example. So without considering uncertainty, what is an intuitive demand model we can see, or we can think about. For example, we may just uh, use the, uh, the average number of total demand or the mean of total demand at each region during, for example, during one hour. We, we can just uh, use that as a demand model. But actually, um, a lot of factors can affect the demand during one day. For example, weather or maybe special events or uh, randomly some accident on the road. So in the real case, the demand in one region can be very different from, from the average value. 
of historical data. So that's why instead of using some specific value, we, we're using a set that can describe with certain probability this demand belongs to this set. But why we choose this type of uncertainty set, why we choose polyhedral or second order cone, that's actually what I want to talk about um, in the next slides, that how to construct uncertainty sets if we, we, we just have original data set of trips of taxis or the trees of taxis of its GPS data. So with only such original data set, how can we construct an uncertain demand model from this data set? So uh, actually, the technique I'm applying is not new. So it's some work recently released um, in the statistics learning or operations research um, area that basically they, st they study how to construct an, a data-driven uncertainty set for some random vector. So here, we can consider our demand model as a random vector. And because we are predicting tau consecutive time slots, so the first step is we concatenate the demand vector of tau time as a larger demand vector with uh, higher dimensions. And we assume that this is a random vector. And from the data set, we assume it satisfies IID distribution, or it is randomly sampled. Though we do not know the true distribution of this random vector, but we can consider, OK, since it all describes what is the demand or what is the trip of the whole city, so we can assume it is the IID sampled. And this is the only assumption we require for constructing uncertainty sets. We even do not assume that each component of this demand vector is independent. And actually, it's not independent. Think about the case that during one hour, the demand at different regions can actually affect each other. Uh, for example, when weather is bad, perhaps people just uh, uh, do not go out. So demand at every region may be uh, smaller than those in good weather. And also, this is, this is a kind of a, a spatial correlation. And also, demand have temporal correlation. Like, uh, when traffic is bad, uh, during 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, people haven't come back home yet. And uh, then in the next hour, there will still be large demands. So there is also temporal correlation. With this. Uh, demand vector RC, we actually include all the spatial and the temporal correlation of this random vector here. So this is the first step. We concatenate the demand vector to a higher dimensional random vector. And the second step is, uh, in our robust optimization problem, the uncertain parameter is uh, included in the objective function part. But actually, every um, robust problem with the uncertainty parameter in the objective function, we can convert it to a problem with uncertain parameter in the constraint function. So um, that's why here with constructing uncertainty sets, we think about the case the uncertain parameter is in the constraint function. So then uh, in the mainly in this recent release, the work, so the approach they provide can guarantee that for a randomly IID sampled data set, we can construct an uncertain set that provides a probability guarantee with a level greater than 1 minus epsilon. This constraint is satisfied when our data has some uncertainty. So basically, what we want is not only a confidence region of this model that 
Usually in uh, machine learning literature, a lot of algorithms, a lot of methods can provide a confidence region or error rate of the learning method itself. But it does not really guarantee the performance of robust optimization later. So that's why when we considering to construct an uncertainty set, we want to have an algorithm that provides us a guarantee for the robust optimization problem, not purely for the uncertain demand model. So fortunately, um, with theories proved in this work, it is possible that uh, based on the process of constructing uncertain sets, we can have both polyhedral type and the second order cone type of uncertainty sets for robust optimization problems. So that's why in our work, when considering uncertainty sets possibly constructed from original data set, we assume for polyhedral and second order cone type of uncertainty sets and develop uh, theories to prove an equivalent form of convex optimization problem. So um, does this answer your question, like why we use this type of uncertainty sets? And uh, now let's see some uh, experimental results with real data set. So this figure shows just uh, uh, the bootstrap the average demand at some selected regions during different hours of one day. And we can see that, uh, uh, for example, region three and uh, region seven here, basically the downtown financial area of San Francisco, it's some busy area that almost during every hour, the total demand is greater than those in other areas. And also, um, in the city, there is some peak hours uh, that uh, the demand is more than those in the same region during different time of one day. So this basically shows the, the average of demand. It does not show the uncertain yet. And if we use this average uh, without uncertainty set, it still gives us information like peak hour or busy areas. If we use this model to run some trace-driven experiment, um, because in our work we care about to balance taxi supply with minimum idle driving distance. So this figure shows that what is the uh, idle driving distance, the total idle driving distance of our taxis in the city when we applying our dispatch approach. Basically, uh, the smaller the better. And uh, we can see that here, uh, without dispatch approach, the idle distance is reduced about 52%. And also, this figure shows what's the real supply-demand ratio at each region. With our dispatch approach, we can see that the blue stars is basically um, the closest to the global level across each region. So this figure shows the result, uh, the supply-demand ratio during one hour. So basically, the global supply-demand ratio at different time of one day is also different. So for convenience, uh, here we pick up uh, one hour as an example that when the global level is fixed here, what is the local supply-demand ratio of each region. And it provides us the results that the supply-demand ratio error is reduced about 45% when we apply this dispatch approach. So then this figure shows when we build some uncertain set, what does it look like? So this is a, a a box type of uncertainty sets. So basically, for example, this box, it represents the range of total demand in region three here, for example. Okay, this is a busy area since the heat map 
region 3, region 7, it looks busy. So this box shows the range of total demand at region 3 during one hour. So here, the process of constructing this type of uncertainty set is basically first run some hypothesis testing about this other statistics of, of the original data. And uh, we literally get an uncertainty set that with a 20% probability guarantee. So that's how it looks like. So um, the second outer cone type of uncertainty set of high dimensional is not easy to show um, in a virilization type. So here I basically plot a polyhedral type of uncertainty set. And if I use this box type of uncertainty model to run some solutions, then the robust problem provides basically a s smaller solution. And uh, we can see that with the, with the total cost greater than 37, the robust optimization problem, um, almost no experiments has a cost uh, greater than 37. But if we don't consider model uncertainties and uh, just uh, make decisions based on, for example, average demand, then the cost is bigger than the case when we consider model uncertainties. So basically, this, this cost figure shows the total cost uh, include both like idle driving distance and uh, demand supply ratio mismatch error. And also, it's the cost in, uh, for example, uh, three or four consecutive time slots. So this figure shows us that with robust optimization solutions, we have a better decision to reduce the cost compared with non-robust case. How are costs measured? Uh, what is the matter? How are costs measured? Oh, so it, it's, it's just a um, number of optimization. For example, we have, uh, it, it, it is just the, the cost of the optimization problem. Yeah. So yeah, uh, of course it can be s uh, scaled up. For example, <coughs> if we design the distance as some uh, larger value, then of course the total cost will increase. But when I compare robust and non-robust solutions, all those parameters are fixed. And uh, the only difference is for robust problem, I add the model uncertainty. So, um, any questions regarding to the experiments? Yeah. Huh? Could you explain a little bit more about this trace-based simulation? Because oh, I see. you have historical data, and at every step you look at the demand, say average or uncertain demand, and then you figure out the dispatch. Mm -hmm. And then the dynamics of this network should propagate, right? So, based on your dispatch. To get the real-time information, you're just look, you're looking at historical data. Uh, yes, um, but uh, um, actually, not every data set is good for trace-driven analysis. Um, for example, here I use San Francisco city data set because it does not include the the trip. It, it, it does not only include the trip information. It actually uh, has the position of each taxi. For example, every thirty seconds or every one minute. So, for example, when I um, have some dispatch decisions and the the taxi should go to a different position compared with the historical data set, but then I can. Uh, I can find out around this new position whether there is some pickup event happens. When there is pickup <coughs> event, means okay here there appeared some passenger, and I can count this as I can uh, count this as one pickup action. Sure. Yeah. Okay. But uh, for example, the New York City data is not good for trace-driven analysis because it does not have the complete trip of each taxi. It only has the pick up and uh, drop off 
uh, time and the location of each taxi. So we do not know what is the, the truth, yeah, what is the path every car goes. So then it is not good for trace-driven analysis. So to summarize, related to this topic, uh, I have uh, several papers that first, uh, the first step of this work is to propose a resting horizon framework and use trace-driven analysis to show that this kind of framework can help us to balance supply as well as reduce idle driving distance. And the second part of the work is um, considering model uncertainties when making decisions. And uh, uh, it has been shown that model uncertainties helps to reduce the cost. And uh, the current work in progress that uh, I'm still testing more methods of constructing uncertainty sets based on larger data set. For example, actually, um, we can find online open source of those big cities. So these figures here shows the heat map of pickup and the drop off events in one city. So, for example, here we can see New York City, Manhattan is definitely hot spots, and in San Francisco, of course, downtown area is uh, um, is hot spots. And for Rome, it's kind of a a, a, re a radio shape, so it's not like here a a, a rectangular uh, block shape. So we actually have a lot of data set we can try and. Uh, um, it's still interesting for me that whether this approach works differently for different structure of the city or for different uh, quality of the data set. But it's uh, a good uh, working direction in the future. And here I show you some uh, Realization of uh, pickup and drop off events in Manhattan area of New York. So basically, the time is accelerated here. But uh, it looks very interesting if we see the pattern of pickup and uh, drop off events. And uh, there is some uh, busy area, and during different time of one day, this pattern actually changes a lot. And uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you. Oh, you mean um, you mean the global sub supply demand ratio should be? Oh, all of the be supply demand ratio. I mean, if, if it's uh, away from one, then it's the it's the measure of uh, that the, the market is not working. Yet. So okay. Right, but if it's close to one, then it's solid. So, uh, so actually, the supply demand ratio one might not be. Um, a, a good uh, value. For, for example, um, if we are considering supply demand ratio in one hour, actually one is not efficient enough because usually a driver can finish several trips in one hour. So I think um, the value you choose should depend on also the traffic condition or the uh, average trip time of taxis in this city. So uh, I have read some reports or statistics that says that uh, most of trips can be finished like within 15 minutes. So which means um, we can set some value if it's supply demand means one taxi may finish four trips in one hour, so things like that. So how to set that number should be more complicated just to say, OK, one, one server for one task. So it's not that case. But uh, actually, um, what I didn't mention in the Resident Horizon Control Framework is, so every time we have the total number of vacant taxis in the city, and uh, we also have a prediction of possible demand in the next uh, following hours, when we, when we see that supply is 
too small to meet all those possible demands, which means, okay, perhaps we, we are experiencing some uh, busy hours, then it means it might be helpful to um, reduce the workload of the system that we, during busy hours, we can send more taxis to the entire system. And once the busy hours um, almost ends, we can uh, dispatch like several taxis, they can just uh, go back to the rest of the place. So it is also um, possible to do some type of uh, a higher level of dispatch based on the supply demand ratio of the whole city. But, uh, but uh, that's not a, a, a clear type of algorithm. It's kind of some heuristic uh, approach. Once we see, okay, this is the case, then how we can adjust the total supply a, a little bit. It's kind of a heuristic approach. Chris, I have a question about the, can you use the slide where you're comparing the robust and non-robust? Uh, the, the, the slides. Yeah, uh, yes. So, so here in the blue one, you are, minima you are optimizing for the uh, worst case within, yes. within your uncertainty set. Yes. So it is uh, expected that the blue tail will uh, fall quickly. But like before seeing this picture, if I would have to guess, I would say like the red, the red curve would be better at lower values. Yeah. But then it would have a long tail. Yeah. But here the blue is better in the worst case and also in the mean. That's exactly what I have um, um, think about when I see this e experiment result. So um, the common sense is the non-robust solutions should be better in like uh, in average sense, mm -hmm. but the robust solution should be better in uh, in a large cost sense. Yeah. But uh, it is not the case here. I think one reason is the demand model itself is a distribution with with large tail, which means it's not like a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, there is a high weight of number in the middle part of the distribution. But uh, uh, when I constructed the uncertainty set, I can clearly see that it's not a normal distribution or it's not a Gaussian distribution. It's very randomly, but you can just uh, boundary it with some box or you can bound it with some second order cone with some ellipsoid. So I guess perhaps because because the, the uncertain demand model, the property of the uncertain demand model, so that's why this robust solution and non-robust solution does not have the form of what we usually have. Because what we usually see is, we, for example, we have a Gaussian or we have a normal distribution noise, and that's the case. But when the uncertain model itself is not Gaussian or it's not normal, we may not necessarily have that result. Alpha, beta, yes. Uh, yes, beta is the, the weighted sum, yes. is the so weight of two objectives. Have you ever tried to use different parameters? Yes. Um, so actually, I have some uh, further slides, like show the result of alpha. Remember, I see that when uh, alpha is close to zero, this penalty, uh, this surrogate function uh, is a uh, is a better approximate for the, for the penalty function. So here I compare the, the result, like when alpha is different value, what's the, uh, what's the solution when I minimize this function? So basically, uh, if uh, the, the optimal solution is very, uh, the small value, then it means we have a good surrogate function, right? So here I show that when uh, alpha is increasing to one, this optimal solution of the, of the surrogate function is increasing. 
So, so which means the result makes this difference larger. So this figure shows why I choose a small alpha for this surrogate function. So the cost here basically just shows the result of this equation. So for every optimal solution I get from this function, I plug it in this equation to calculate the cost. And when alpha is increasing, the cost is also increasing. And for beta, so um, actually we can see that when beta changes, it means we change the weight of our two objectives. For, 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 um, So uh, this is a choice analysis data uh, without considering model uncertainties yet. So um, I basically just shows when uh, when beta is uh, small, for example, just a zero. Uh, so here uh, the beta is the weight for the idle driving distance. So when beta is zero means we actually only consider to balance supply demand ratio without considering the idle distance possibly by our dispatch solution. When beta is zero, then of course the idle distance is not that good, but the supply demand ratio is almost uh, perfectly matched. When beta is increasing means we increase the weight of uh, idle distance in our objective function. And of course, we are getting a uh, slightly better total idle driving distance. But meanwhile, because idle driving distance is the problem we care about, we cannot always send uh, taxis to positions that to make the supply demand ratio balance. So that's why when idle driving distance is dec decreasing a little bit, the supply demand ratio is not that good. That is not that close to the global level yet. So that's how the, the, the objective weight parameter beta will affect the final solution. Other question? Oh, yes, Oh, you mean? Uh, like, uh, for example, one extension would be to try to solve this problem in a distributed way among the three companies. Mm -hmm. Some limit collaboration, maybe. Okay. So uh, first, the structure of the original problem. Uh, the structure of the original problem. So, if just a distributed algorithm, it does not work well because there is a, a spatial and a temporal correlations a lot. So a distributed algorithm itself does not work. But for the case that when several companies are competing in the whole city, um, I've been thinking about that one possible way, maybe some game theory among those companies, they have some common information, but they also have private information, and uh, it may affect their decisions. And uh, another quick way to considering competing companies might be still how we build this demand model. For example, as a taxi company, usually the, the data is public. It's kind of a government's requirement that data set is public. But for on-demand service company like Uber and Lyft, their data is private, so we do not have idea how many passengers they pick up, what is the uh, euro behavior pattern of Uber drivers. But, but if I am someone in, in the um, traditional taxi company, and uh, I know that Uber also is competing with the taxi company to get more passengers, then I can consider this type of behavior as part of uncertainty in the demand model of uh, traditional taxi service. So that's kind of another way to deal with uh, uncertainties caused by other companies in the city.
Yes. Yes, it is possible that uh, when you have some suggestion to the drivers and they do not follow it. Um, so then it is uh, kind of another question, uh, like how to design incentive to make the drivers follow the suggestion. So I think that might be an interesting direction for future work that. But uh, for, for the dispatch framework I propose here, I just want to show that if everybody just uh, follow this uh, framework, what will happen? Will the uh, idle distance be reduced? Will the cost be reduced? So in this work, I uh, just uh, show the result purely on the algorithm. Yes, it is also, um, so it just uh, add one more parameter in the problem. For example, the total number of vacant taxis will not be exactly the number of dispatch. It will be, for example, 80% of the number of dispatch, so things like that. But uh, how to choose that parameter is very tricky, and uh, it actually affects the result. So, yeah, I... I did think about this problem, but it, it still needs um, more work or better model to describe such kind of situation. Okay, then we can take uh, any further questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.